Hello and welcome to Numerous to Call. We are concluding our four video series on machine learning for business with this video. So this will be the fourth and final video in the series. In this video, we're going to talk about a lot of the real world considerations about how you would apply a model in a business context. So it's tempting as a data scientist to be working on a problem and in your head you start reducing the problem to just, I've got this data set and I've got my metric and I want to do all the do all the activity, try all the different things to get that metric as low as possible. And in this video, we're gonna we're gonna sort of go beyond that and think about what are the real world considerations uh, I should be thinking about from the problem formulation all the way down to when you're evaluating your model. So I hope you'll find it useful. Um, if you have a chance before we get into it, if you could please uh, like the video and subscribe to the channel, that really helps me out a lot. And with that said, let's get into the video. In this module, we're going to go beyond simple metrics and talk about some real-world model considerations and ways in which you want to evaluate and assess your model in the real world. So first, let's start about some questions you might want to ask while you're formulating the problem that you're trying to address with machine learning. So one question that's good to ask is, you know, will a model help solve my business problem? And one way to really hone in on this is to think about what decision do we want to make differently? So typically when you're trying to build a data product or something like that, the idea is you're making some decision repeatedly and you think that a machine learning method would do a better job at making that decision. So one thing to get at is what is that decision and how much better could we make it? The second question is, is there enough signal in my data? So it may be the case that you just can't predict the thing that you're trying to predict as well as you would like to, and that no modeling will help you because there's just not enough signal in the data. There's just not enough variation in the different cases to be able to say meaningfully different things about those different cases. So related to that is the question of what kind of predictive performance do I need? How well would this model have to stratify your population in order to, to give you something that's meaningful in a business sense. Related to this is also this idea of precision versus recall and how we trade them off. You might have a problem where if you have high precision and low recall, that might still be valuable. However, in other problems that may not be valuable. So for example, in a fraud detection scenario, if you could detect very with very high precision that a small percentage of the, the fraud, if you could predict those cases with high precision, but it's only a small percentage of the overall fraud, is that worthwhile? It may depend on the particular application, it may depend on how costly it is to implement. Likewise, some situations you might be able to build a model that has relatively low precision but pretty good recall. So what this effectively means is you could weed out some cases that are definitely not yeses, but your the prediction the population that you're predicting yes on will still have relatively low precision. So again, this all comes down to evaluating the specifics of your business problem and how it relates to the model. And we're going to go through some examples of all these. So I'm, I'm setting these up just to give some framing questions you might want to ask. Another question you want to ask is are the relevant features available at prediction time? A lot of times we work with historical data and we'll build a model with some features and we don't realize that when we go into production, into real time, that the features we relied on are actually not available at the time we would like to make the prediction. Similarly, we sometimes forget to assess how difficult it is to add in all of these features to a model in production. So it may be the case that you've got different features, they add a little bit of predictive power to your model, but it's actually very costly to build the data pipeline to get those, those features into your model in production. And then you need to make that assessment of, you know, is the value of these features worth the difficulty it's going to be to actually put them into the model in production. So let's talk through these in, in terms of a a hypothetical example. So suppose you were tasked with building a churn prevention model and 
your goal, you know, the outline of this model is you want to find the people who are likely to churn and do some intervention on them that will hopefully stop them from churning. So the first question is, you know, will a model help solve my business problem? How much will this help? So what do we need to be successful at the business problem? Well, we need to detect high risk churners. So there have to be people that have a significantly higher risk of churning than others. And we need to be able to intervene effectively on them. So we have to make sure that when we detect someone, can, is there actually anything we can do about it to stop them from churning? So, you know, a common example of, of churn, which you might be able to detect but not do anything about, comes from the, you know, the old school dating sites that people would pay, like Match.com, where a lot of times people churn because they met their partner and they got married. <laughs> then you might be able to detect that this person is going to churn. I can detect it with very high precision but you won't be able to uh, intervene effectively because that, per, that churn will be unpreventable. So what decision do we want to make differently? So in the framing of this problem, the decision we want to make is who should we intervene on? We've got supposedly some intervention and that intervention clearly must have some cost, otherwise we would just give it to everyone. But we think if we could use this intervention on somebody who has a significantly high risk of churning, if their risk of churn is high enough, the cost of the intervention will be worth it. So this, is, this becomes the question, how narrowly do we need to prioritize the intervention? How much does this intervention cost? Do we have a fixed supply of this intervention and we can intervene on 10 cases a month and it's the same cost whether we use those 10 or not? Or is it a cost per intervention? If it's a cost per intervention, we have to make a calculation around how, uh, how high does that risk of churning have to be and how effective does the intervention have to be at preventing churn to, be, to justify its worth. So for example, suppose your intervention is to give them a free month of your service. If the intervention is to give them a free month of your service, you have to be sure that their risk of churn uh, is high enough and they will their typical reaction will be to stay long enough beyond that that free period for it to be worth it so is there enough signal in my data this is another question if I'm doing my churn prevention model and let's say overall I have a 10% churn rate and my model can identify that half the people have an 11% churn rate and half the people have a 9% churn rate that might not be enough discrimination for it to really be worth it. You just won't be able to say that much. Now, how do you assess if there's signal in your data? Well, you can think about like, do we know any strong indicators offhand? If, if you know, kind of anecdotally or your domain expertise, you know that, oh, certain categories are going to have a, a very high churn rate and that you think you can detect those, then, then that's a good sign. But you have to think about what features also are available and you know how how related you think they are offhand to the uh, to the the act of churning so if i'm working on a problem and they tell me well we have the customer's age and we have how long they've been a customer and that's really all we have to build a churn model on that may not be enough to really give a high level of discrimination but if you've got very rich demographics, you've got a big history of their interactions, you have a lot of data on how they're using your service, that might be a much stronger uh, set of features to work with. But in most cases, to be totally sure, you really just need to check and build the model, right? You can have some speculation, you could have some, some uh, suspicions beforehand, and it's useful to think about those. But of course, you're never totally sure until you actually build the model. Going forward with the question is, what kind of predictive performance do I need? So again, if, uh, if I found a very small group of people with a very high churn rate, but it wasn't everybody who's going to churn, well, in this case, that might be okay. If I could find a small segment of people that are very high risk of churning, and I'm pretty confident my intervention will work, then, then that's a good case. It doesn't matter that I can't get all of the churn. I don't need to stop every single person that might churn. I just need to reduce my churn rate 
that might be effective if I can just find a small slice that has a very high turn rate, if I, if I know how to, how to intervene on them effectively. What about low precision, high recall? If I can say, hey, this 30% is definitely not going to turn, but this other 70% uh, you know, has a moderately higher risk than average of churning. Is there an intervention that would make sense to do on that population? It may or may not be the case. Often in those situations, if the intervention is so cheap that you could give it to 70% of the population, you could probably just give it to 100% of the population and not need a model at all. So for example, if you're just going to send out an email saying, hey, we really love having you as a customer, you know, please let us know if you have any problems, um, you could send that out to just people at a high risk, but you could probably just send it out to everybody. It's the same cost. And here's where back of the envelope calculations are really valuable. You could think about, you know, do the math about what your precision is going to be, what your recall is going to be, how effective your intervention is going to be, and get a sense of what your churn rate would be with a successful model and given what you're doing now or given a really simple solution that maybe doesn't involve a model. And again, the question of are the relevant features available at prediction time? So let's give a hypothetical here. Let's imagine we had some third-party data source where you could tell whether people have unsubscribed to similar products. So you could tell, for example, when someone unsubscribed from Netflix and you say, if they unsubscribe from Netflix, they're at high risk of unsubscribing from, from my service. And you have this third party data source and you get the data and uh, you build your model and you find that, hey, this is actually predictive. If they unsubscribe from Netflix the, in the next month or two, they're much higher risk of unsubscribing from my service. Um, now, you might build this model and use that data source, but then when you go to prediction time, you realize that, oh, there's actually a 90-day lag in getting the data. You don't find out about the people who quit Netflix in April until July, and by then, it's too late. So you have to think about the timeliness of the data. And finally, how difficult is it to obtain these features? We talked about you know, the cost to build data pipelines. If you've got features that are you know, complicated to compute or have to connect systems that maybe don't like to talk to each other, that can be a big expense. Also, if you're using third-party data, you've got to think about what's the cost of that data. And again, combine these with some back-of-the-envelope calculations to, to get a sense of, is this worth it? Is, is the bang for the buck I'm going to get? by improving my model worth uh, these costs. And these costs can be very, very significant. The next example I want to talk about is, is hospital readmissions. This is something I've actually worked on in the past. And this came from uh, when Obamacare first came out. There were penalties on hospitals for having high readmission rates, specifically for heart failure patients. This was in the early year or two of Obamacare. It was restricted to heart failure patients. And so hospitals had a really strong incentive to reduce their readmission rates for heart failure patients. So readmission rate means you go to the hospital, you're a heart failure patient, uh, you get discharged from the hospital. If you end up coming back to the hospital within 30 days, there's a sense in which that was a failure for the hospital. They didn't treat you well enough if you're coming back so quickly. So uh, Obamacare had incentives to, for hospitals to reduce their readmission rates. So you can imagine a machine learning approach to this where you build a model on heart failure patients to predict their readmission risk, and then you can intervene on those patients. In this case, while they're in the hospital, you give them some extra care, you kind of make sure they know everything they're supposed to do before they go home, and you know, kind of give them some extra handling. And you hope that this is going to bring down the readmission rates on those patients. That sounds like a reasonable approach, but as we're going to see, there, there are lots of small issues that come up in practice that actually seem small, but then prove to be more than just small issues. So the first issue is that high risk is not the same as saying you'll have a lower risk with the intervention. So uh, the intervention, this extra hand-holding and so forth, was ineffective on some types of cases. So for example, um, 
there, there are patients who uh, have to come into the hospital for dialysis. They can't afford dialysis, so they just wait until they get sick and they go to the hospital for dialysis. And those patients, no matter how much hand-holding and so forth you give them while they're in the hospital, they're, they're kind of going to come back anyway. Um, it was a similar case for a lot of different types of cancer patients. If they're just very sick with cancer, no matter what kind of intervention you did, they were, they were very likely to come back regardless of what kind of intervention you did. So in fact, if you think about it, the, the framing of the problem is wrong that you want to detect people with a high risk of readmission. What you really want to predict is patients who would have a high reduction in readmission risk with the intervention compared to without the readmission. So rather than just plain high readmission risk. So if somebody has a 40% readmission rate, but if you give them the intervention, they're still going to be a 40% readmission rate. That doesn't really help. Whereas somebody that has a 20% readmission rate, but with the intervention, they would go down to a 3% readmission rate. Well, that would be a valuable use of the intervention. So sometimes the way you frame the problem initially is not, not quite the right framing. The problem, of course, with the second measure, this high reduction in readmission risk, is it's very difficult to assess or measure because you don't have the counterfactual of what, what this person's readmission rate would be in both scenarios. When you're learning from historical data, you typically only see the, what their readmission rate was without the intervention. Now, one practical solution of what you can do in these cases is if you know about certain categories of patients for whom the intervention is likely to be ineffective, you can just filter them out. So you can filter out these cancer patients, these compassionate dialysis cases, and uh, you know, hope that what's left over are the people who will actually be responsive to the, to the intervention. A second issue has to do with the real-time identification of this population, which was heart failure patients. So you can build a model on heart failure patients, and the hospital has records of everyone who was a heart failure patient. The problem is that these patients, these heart failure patients, according to this law, were defined by their discharge diagnosis. So when you're looking back retrospectively, you can identify all the people who, after they left the hospital and after their discharge diagnosis was determined, um, which ones of those were heart failure patients. But when you're in production, so to speak, when you're running this model at a hospital on the patients who were in the hospital at that time, you don't have their discharge diagnosis yet. You only have the discharge diagnosis when they leave the hospital and it's too late to intervene on them once they leave the hospital. So in this case, you might need a second model to predict the discharge diagnosis from the earlier features. Uh, from the features like early in their hospital stay, from everything you would know about them kind of when they arrived to the hospital and shortly after. And again, this just shows that what seemed like a simple problem could actually prove to be much more complicated, and the solution that you thought might be a very simple one might prove to be much more costly. A third issue is what's the value of a great model? versus a mediocre model. And I think this is where I'm going to get into some back of the envelope calculations to say, you know, should I build a model? Is this, how likely is this solution to be successful? Is there enough gains to be harvested from a really good model versus doing nothing or doing something very simple? So let's, let's make some very simplifying assumptions about this problem just to kind of ballpark how valuable this model might be. So assume your population is one-third low risk, one-third medium risk, and one-third high risk, and that the low risk patients have a 5% readmission rate, the medium risk have a 15% readmission rate, and the high risk have a 25% readmission rate. So overall, the population would have a 15% readmission rate. And assume that the intervention lowers the risk to 5% when it's effective. So your, your intervention doesn't really do anything for the low risk patients but it will turn medium and high risk patients into low risk patients. And let's further assume that we can intervene on 10% of the population. So if you do a quick back of the envelope calculation, what do you find? Well, if I had the best possible model, it would always identify high risk patients. And so if you do the math, this would reduce your readmission rate from 15% 
to 13%. Because on that 10% of the population, you would change them from 25% to 5%, so it's a reduction of 20% times 10% gives you a 2% reduction. But now let's say I have a very simple model. Let's say if we didn't have a model and we just asked people to kind of pick and choose who looked risky, let's say you would, could still generally end up with a population that was half high risk and half medium risk. Um, what readmission rate would you get then? Well, if you do the math, it means you would reduce it from 15% to 13.5%. And this is comparing, so that half a percent could be significant um, in a lot of cases that that half a percent might be worth doing something, some, a lot of work to get. Um, but, you know, this is also comparing sort of like a perfect model to like a pretty mediocre model. As you're working and trying to improve this model and maybe putting in more features, you might think about, well, with a simple model, let's say I get seven high risk and three medium risk. And if I do lots of things and really improve the model and really use the latest techniques and bring in all the features to bear, I'll get eight high risk patients and two medium risk patients, you might say, hey, is that really worth it? Is it really worth that, you know, is that 0.2% uh, worth all the effort I'm doing, all the extra cost, all the potential delays, all the potential complications that might come up from things breaking because you've got more features. So this is just to show that um, you really, when you're building a data product, it's really important to play things out, do some calculations, get a sense of how effective your model is likely to be, and, and really do some deep thinking before you go too far down the road. Because you don't want to be in the position where you spent a lot of time and effort, you've done all this work to improve your model, you spent a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of resources, and then realize that actually you would have done almost as good with something very, very simple. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoy this video and enjoy this series. We'll be uh, continuing with a new series where we talk about the, the fundamentals of gradient boosting. So we're really going to talk about how gradient boosting works from the decision tree all the way up. Um, so that'll be our next series of videos that will kick off probably next week. Uh, in the meantime, again, hope you enjoy this video. If you have a chance, please like the video and subscribe to the channel so that you can help me out a little bit. And uh, I hope to see you uh, in a future video. Bye-bye.